As Abraham Lincoln prepared his annual message to Congress at the end of 1861, it was a dreary time in Washington, D.C., and throughout the United States. The first year of the Civil War was drawing to a close, with no end to the war in sight. The Union had lost the only major battles that had been fought thus far, and there was danger that additional slave states would join the Confederacy. He had not yet conceived of issuing an Emancipation Proclamation, and in fact he had ordered an overzealous general, John C. Fremont, to rescind his own Emancipation Proclamation for fear of antagonizing those additional states. Yet the struggle for emancipation was very much on Lincoln's mind as he wrote his message to Congress. He detested slavery. He always had. But as president, especially at such a perilous moment, he did not yet feel he had the power to act on his feelings. There was no avoiding the issue, though. Months earlier, escaped slaves had arrived at Fortress Monroe, the impressive U.S. Army fort on the southern tip of the Virginia Peninsula. There, near the site where the first African slaves were brought to the English colonies 242 years earlier, Army General Benjamin Butler had declared these runaway slaves as contraband of war. When Confederate soldiers showed up at the fort, demanding their slaves be returned to them under the despicable Fugitive Slave Act of 1850, General Butler refused and then wrote to the War Department of his intention to set these slaves free. Radical Republicans in Congress seized upon this idea and passed the Confiscation Act, which would allow other army officers to follow Butler's lead. Lincoln was still hesitant to act, but all of this must have been running through his mind as he penned his message to Congress. He wrote, The struggle of today is not altogether for today. It is for a vast future also. What that future was, he could not foresee. Lincoln came from the old Whig party, and like many Whigs, he had dabbled in the idea of colonization of liberated slaves in Africa or Central America. As Lincoln pondered an Emancipation Proclamation the following summer, even stout abolitionists like Massachusetts Governor John Andrew told him they did not want freed slaves living among them. Would emancipation lead to further bloodshed? Race war? With the Haitian Revolution, the omnipresent fear of all white Americans of the early 1800s replay itself here in America on a grander scale? Would whites, conversely, murder blacks rather than live alongside them? Lincoln considered all these possibilities. He called Frederick Douglass to the White House, listened to his opinion, but did not let on to him that an Emancipation Proclamation was on the immediate horizon. Lincoln was waiting only for a Union battlefield victory to issue his proclamation, convinced by Secretary of State William Seward that he should issue it from a position of strength, not one of weakness. Frederick Douglass left his meeting with Lincoln frustrated. What does this man not understand, Douglass wondered. Why does he not act? Then the shocking moment came. The Union won a major battle near Antietam Creek in Maryland, halting Confederate General Robert E. Lee's invasion of the North. Lincoln would wait no longer. It was time to act. On September 22, 1862, he issued his preliminary Emancipation Proclamation, setting forth that beginning on January 1st, all slaves liberated by the Union Army as they penetrated rebellious states would be then, thenceforward, and forever free. Just as shockingly, the proclamation announced Lincoln's intention to admit black recruits into the U.S. Army. The Confederates and the Northern Democratic press went into a furor, but the deed was done. January 1st, 1863 would be the date when the United States would have a new birth of freedom, as Lincoln would put it months later at Gettysburg. As the last hours of 1862 ticked away, black Americans gathered throughout the North to celebrate. Not their own freedom, which was already secure, but the freedom of millions like them who had known nothing but degradation and despair. From that moment forward, the Union Army carried freedom with it. 
And soon, the blue uniforms not only freed the black men, but clothed them, as 180,000 would volunteer for the army by the time the war was done, a full one-fifth of the Union army. Yet the war raged on and on. Only final victory could make the proclamation permanent. Only the gallantry of Union soldiers, white and black, could keep the hope of freedom alive and carry on that struggle for a vast future. As thousands were laid to rest at Gettysburg in November 1863, Lincoln dedicated the country to that new birth of freedom he envisioned and spoke of the epic, unfinished work that remained. As the death toll grew ever larger and the elections of 1864 drew nearer, advisors urged Lincoln to back down on the Emancipation Proclamation for the good of his election prospects. He refused and instead forced his entire cabinet to sign on to a letter in which they pledged to finish the work of emancipation before the new administration was inaugurated, should they lose, which looked almost certain. Instead, he emerged triumphant, and before his new term could even begin, he was pushing for the passage of a 13th Amendment to abolish slavery in the United States once and for all. This was far from his work alone. He had been late to the game, many would charge, justifiably so. Frederick Douglass, William Still, William Lloyd Garrison, Wendell Phillips, Thaddeus Stevens, old John Brown. Many had toiled longer for this goal. But only one man was in the final position to get the job done, and Abraham Lincoln was that man. The poet Stephen Vincent Benet, Describing Lincoln's actions to end slavery during the war in his epic poem, John Brown's Body, wrote the following. It takes a long time to bring a thought into act. And when it blossoms at last, the gardeners wonder. There have been so many to labor this patch of ground. Garrison, Beecher, a dozen New England names. Courageous, insulting Sumner. Narrow and strong with his tongue of silver and venom and his wrecked body. Wendell Phillips, Antonis of Harvard. But now that the thought has arisen, they are not sure it was their thought after all. It is good enough, the best one could expect from a man like Lincoln. But this and that are wrong or unshrewdly planned. We could have done it better. We knew the ground. It should have been done before in a different way. And our praise is grudging. Let us pity the gardeners. Let us pity Boston. Pity the pure in heart. Pity the men whom time goes past in the night without their knowledge. They worked through the awful heat of the day. So much for the banner bearers of abolition, the men who carried the lonely flag for years and could bear defeat with the strength of the pure in heart, but could not understand the face of success. But success had finally come. Months after the amendment passed, the war was ending at last. Crowds gathered in Washington, D.C., serenading the president, pleading with him to speak, to gush about the Union victory. What they got was entirely unexpected. Lincoln emerged, spoke only briefly, and with no arrogance or well-deserved glee. He gave some very restrained comments, once again mourned the dead, and spoke of the unfinished work that still remained to be done he spoke of giving black men the right to vote. Had the crowd heard that right? One man in the crowd was certain he had, John Wilkes Booth. Booth, who had before this been planning to kidnap President Lincoln to allow the South to rise again, now wrote in his diary, that would mean N-word citizenship. That's it, I'll run him through. It was when Lincoln spoke of black suffrage that Booth decided Lincoln had to die. Thus, when Lincoln was assassinated by Booth a few days later, he became one of the first martyrs to the cause of black voting and civil rights. But the drum of history beat on. There was great optimism for a time. Hundreds of thousands of former slaves learned to read and write, which had been illegal during slavery. Hundreds of thousands cast ballots for the first time. Hundreds had been elected to office themselves. 
But just as importantly, the humanity of black men and women was legally acknowledged for the first time. The Constitution was reborn. Black marriages gained legal standing. Families that had been cruelly separated during slavery were now reunited. Churches sprang up to bring the black community together. As the black historian and academic W.E.B. Du Bois said, though, the slave went free, stood a brief moment in the sun, and then went back into slavery. Terror struck the land. The hooded Ku Klux Klan and the not-so-hooded White League seized on the growing national weariness and violently took back control of southern state governments, or redeemed them, as they absurdly called it. What followed was decades of lynchings, intimidation, segregation, and dehumanization. The Republican Party of the era turned its back on black Republicans. So too did the crusading women fighting for the right to vote themselves. Black leaders like Frederick Douglass, who had been the one to first propose at Seneca Falls in 1848 that women should seek suffrage, were horrified as white Americans of North and South underwent reconciliation at the expense of blacks, Douglas proclaimed, We are sometimes asked, in the name of patriotism, to forget the merits of that fearful struggle and to remember with equal admiration those who struck at the nation's life and those who struck to save it, those who fought for slavery and those who fought for liberty and justice. I am no minister of malice, I would not strike the fallen. I would not repel the repentant. But may my right hand forget her cunning, and may my tongue cleave to the roof of my mouth, if I forget the difference between the parties to that terrible, protracted, and bloody conflict. His words were, sadly, of no use. White America was moving on, and no remembrances of the shared gallantry of black and white soldiers fit into this new vision of the past, that was settled upon. Seeing the major step backwards that was coming for black rights, Congressman Robert B. Elliott gave one of his last speeches in Congress in support of the doomed Civil Rights Act of 1875. What you give to one class, you must give to all, Elliott stated. What you deny to one class, you deny to all. This echoed the words of Lincoln in 1862. In giving freedom to the slave, we assure freedom to the free, honorable alike in what we give and what we preserve. But it was of no use. As Eliot plaintively but defiantly said, I remember that valor, devotion, and loyalty are not always rewarded according to their just deserts, and that after the battle, Some who have borne the brunt of the fray may, through neglect or contempt, be assigned to a subordinate place, while the enemies in war may be preferred to the sufferers. Black America was forced back down into the darkness of oppression. It would be decades before the next signs of life for that new birth of freedom that came out of the Civil War. Decades in which hope was clung to only by quick gasps of air. When hope's time finally came, when Dr. King and John Lewis and so many others stepped into the shoes of Frederick Douglass and Robert Elliott and so many others, when men and women crossed bridges and climbed to the mountaintop, America reckoned with its original sin as it hadn't done since Reconstruction. In the midst of that, at Gettysburg in 1963, Father Theodore Hesburgh of Notre Dame proclaimed, It may not have occurred to you, but each one of us must be, in these our times, great emancipators, to finish up as completely and as dramatically as possible the unfinished business of which Lincoln spoke here, the work of freedom, Individual Americans died here, and only individual Americans can make that for which these soldiers died at Gettysburg come true in their own communities. The appalling dearth of freedom for millions of Americans today in voting, 
in employment, in housing, in education, in public accommodations, and in the administration of justice is not something automatic. It is a positive act. It is freedom denied by one American to another American. And until every white American decides to act morally towards every black American, there is no end to the unfinished business. Now, in this, our own time, we consider where our country stands decades later. Dr. King once said that the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. May we not well ask how far we have come along that arc? What would Frederick Douglass think if we brought him to the 21st century? In his later years, Douglas was asked by a student for any advice he could give on what best to do in life. His simple response? Agitate. 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 If we could ask him, he would tell us to agitate for right, for justice, for equality. What must still be agitated for today? What are the issues that still cry out for social justice? As we examine these exhibits and we reflect on the heroes and struggles of the past, let us not lose sight of the unfinished work which Lincoln knew would always remain to build our more perfect union, the unfinished work that remains for us today. Thank you.